Hello and welcome to this special edition of Showcase, where we take a look back at artists we featured on the show this past year. Let's begin with Henry Moore, who's left behind a global footprint of sculptures, from the gardens of Tokyo to the museums of Buenos Aires. And now, a collection of the sculptor's lesser-known pieces can be seen in an exhibition in London. We sent Showcase's Miranda Atti to explore another side of Henry Moore. Henry Moore's helmet heads are definitely smaller than many of his other pieces that adorn the lawns or forecourts of museums and sculpture parks around the world. But they're no less powerful. Curated by arms and armour expert Tobias Capwell, this exhibition has drawn a parallel between suits of armour here at the Wallace Collection and the Sculptor's Helmet series. As early as the 1920s, Moore made multiple trips here. The Wallace Collection, which contains all kinds of art, armoury and sculptures, was bequeathed to the British nation in 1897. His interest in the Wallace is well known. What has never been pursued before is the question of what specifically he was interested in. Which objects here were speaking to him? Why? And what did he do with that inspiration? The series is minimal, with just seven official helmet heads. Seen side by side, the similarity between the sculptures and the armor is striking. Tobias hopes the exhibition will not only shed new light on the helmet head series, but get people to see suits of armor from a new perspective. And we have this very utilitarian uh, view of them, which is not untrue, they are that, but historical arms and armor of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance was so much more than that. It's wearable sculpture. In fact, it turns your body into a living sculpture. To adorn the body is a fundamental human impulse. And when you clad yourself in metal, what an opportunity to create the image of a, of a superhero or a god. The Wallace Collection explores Moore's whole process, including sketches and casts, and the different materials he used, from lead and bronze to plaster. The helmet heads do seem to appear at key moments. Uh, the very first one was created on the eve of the Second World War. Uh, and then there's a strong period of development in the early 1950s when Moore has now lived through two world wars. He fought as a machine gunner in the First World War. But he's also in the 1950s realizing that it isn't over. The Iron Curtain's come down. Uh, troops are being sent to Korea. You can already see the rumblings of the, the American War in Southeast Asia. Um, so that period is very unsettled and it flares up in that, in that period as well. Moore famously called his helmets a recording of things inside other things. And each sculpture can be read in multiple ways. There are echoes of the relationship between a mother and child. Do the sculptures protect or imprison? What is the difference between our inner and our exterior forms? The meanings remain ambiguous, but with this exhibition at least, we're one step closer to his inspiration. He's one of the most famous sculptors of the 20th century, so you'd be forgiven for thinking that every aspect of Moore's work has already been explored. But this exhibition offers something entirely new. It's the first and probably the only time that Moore's helmet heads will be exhibited alongside the armour that inspired them. Miranda Ratti, TRT World, London. With pieces titled Beach Girl and The Mother's Monster, it's no surprise that artist Jim McKenzie's work isn't for the faint-hearted. Some people find it beautiful, others say it's the stuff nightmares are made of. But with hundreds of thousands of followers on social media, it's clear his work is getting a lot of attention for all kinds of reasons.
He's been called a 20th century pharaoh and a cultural ambassador for Egypt. Hassan al Shark is an internationally acclaimed artist whose talents helped put his village on the world map. But while the themes of his pieces are one story, the way he creates them is another entirely different one. This is one of Hassan al Shark's favorite spots to get to work atop of a hill in the village of Zawiyat Sultan, where he was born and still resides. Al Shark is an award-winning visual artist who chronicles the Egyptian country life. I wanted to preserve heritage through my work. For instance, a countrywoman tailor makes her own garment, but when there's an extra piece of fabric, she turns it into a doll or puppet for her daughter. She doesn't go and buy it from a store. No, she makes the doll herself. That is something I document in my paintings. And he's been doing exactly that ever since he was a child. But back then, his canvas was meat wrapping paper he took from his father's butcher shop. After years of work, Al Shark now displays his paintings at his home that he turned into an art museum. But one thing that hasn't changed is how he creates the colors he paints with, using natural materials such as mud, grass, leaves, and even spices. I'm very proud of the paintings I made by creating colors, which sit in the world's largest museums. I am proud that I, Hassan al Shark, a descendant of the pharaohs, can generate tourism myself. It was a German art critic who came across his pieces in 1985 and paved the way for Al Shark to become an internationally acclaimed artist. And now the people of Egypt are grateful for what he's achieved. The truth is that he doesn't only express the beauty of Egypt and the East, but he also represents a condition that we miss. He's reviving heritage. He's reviving things that we might have lost over the years. And that's why Al Shark is not only considered a successful painter by his people, but a national treasure of Egypt. Not far away from the cacophony of Istanbul's Grand Bazaar sits the workshop of a man known as the Lord of the Rings. He's been making jewelry since the age of 12 that is now worn by some of the most famous people in the world, from A-list actors to rock and roll royalty. By using precious stones as a canvas, Sevan Bıçakçı has carved out a world that the entire world comes to see. And when he opened his studio to showcase, so did we. Every ring is one of a kind, so each has its very own story. Sometimes I tell a story inside a gemstone, but other times the gemstone has a story to tell me. I mean, we stay in touch and I think we get along quite well. I'm not an historian, but I'm still very lucky when it comes to connecting with my past. I was born and lived in Samatya, one of the oldest places in Istanbul, which used to be located within the ancient walls of Constantinople. I had my training in the Grand Bazaar, where I met my master at the age of 12. A couple of generations ago, the Grand Bazaar was actually a school for artisans. Later, a certain mentality has emerged, dictating that you have to produce a certain type of jewelry using only certain techniques. And it's all about cheap manufacturing and machine production now. But that's just not me. Here's the crux of the matter. A ring isn't just a geometrical shape, but rather where the craftsman finds freedom to tell his stories. There are and have been thousands of jewelry workshops all around the world throughout history. And all creators want to express themselves with a ring and to leave their unique mark. And I got lucky because an idea struck me one day, a simple idea. I just flipped a gemstone over 
and there was a shape of a dome and with it also the beginning of this design. This shape created an empty space for us to work on. Later, we found a way to fill the space. People may think we empty out the gemstone and place a figure inside, but that's not the case. We actually carve these figures into the stone upside down and later color it. This technique is called negative sculpting. And later on, we developed the technique even further and found a way to build 3D designs into the stones. I was surrounded by history. So when the time came, these stories came out naturally. This ring, for example, is very special to me. According to an old Armenian tradition, there is this ritual called blessing of the pomegranates. Every year we open our shops on the first day of the year. But before even putting our foot in the shop, we throw a pomegranate at the threshold and the fruit breaks into pieces. Its seeds scatter all over, inside as well as outside of the shop. And we believe this brings an abundance of blessing. My master used to say, we should welcome the good fortune, but also give some of it back. That's what I see when I look at this ring. Now we're also designing watches, and there's a story behind this too. Years ago, I visited an old clock collection at the Topkapi Palace, featuring pieces from the Ottoman times, from the 17th century onwards. There I saw there used to be very interesting clockmaker masters who have lived in Turkey. These were Malawi dervishes, who used to produce clocks with no commercial concerns. Some have only created one or two clocks in their lifetime, but they still work to this day. And look, there was no industry back then, so we wanted to put in as much effort as they did. And these last nine years, we have done that. We will have our 80-piece watch collection very soon. But obviously no magic is involved in the creation of a piece of jewelry. It's not like the skies tear apart and there comes the inspiration. The truth of the story is this is a hard-earned vision I extracted from the history. There's also teamwork behind it all. We have a crowded team here with our creative director Emre Delava and a group that includes designers, goldsmiths, stone setters and a sculptor. Everyone is welcome to bring their own story to the table. We see ourselves not like the knights, but like the artisans of the round table. Because everyone can have a say in the creation of a piece. Arts and craft are disappearing today. The old ways can't compete against technology, but we should remember our origins and where it all began. Maybe in some part of the world someone watches this and ends up wanting to actually do something about it. If there is just one person who feels that way, well, I'd call that having left a legacy. Let's take a look now at the unusual kinetic sculptures of KZ Kern. His engrossing works appear in a constant state of growth and bloom, which open and close with the simplest of movements, turning audiences into much more than merely passive observers.
This next artist completed his first oil painting at the age of 12. But over the years, he moved away from a traditional 2D approach and started creating works that have many sides and many meanings with clean, sharp lines. And today, his creations reflect deeply the close link between humanity and nature. Let's take a look at how he brings this idea to life. His name sits among the most prominent masters of the Dutch Golden Age of painting. You might know Peter Bruegel the Elder for his Hunters in the Snow landscape behind me, probably his most famous piece. And now, on the 450th anniversary of his death, Brussels is celebrating the Flemish painter with a glittery series of special events honoring his life and work. One of them took place at Brussels Royal Museum of Fine Arts. In his paintings, unlike most of his peers, he focused on the working class, nature, women and, well, monsters. His art is rimmed with many symbols and details, and it's also varied in terms of subject. As well as creating hellish monsters, Renaissance painter Peter Bruegel the Elder depicted elaborate landscapes too. He painted in a realistic manner, defying the time's fascination with idealistic settings and features. It's said that he painted the world as he saw it. Italians will have focused, I think, mo mostly on the ideal depiction of, of the human, which is, of course, a prime creation, maybe, of nature in contem contemporary thinking, certainly depicted uh, this way. Bruegel will focus on nature from a different angle, from the human of all kinds, also certainly the human of the lower classes, of the peasant class, of the popular life, which was not to that point uh, a topic for, um, for art and then also on nature in the sense of creative nature itself, for example, climate, weather, atmospheric conditions. 
His 16th century works talk about gender roles and the politics of common people through his witty and intricate characters. So it could be said that, even several centuries later, Brogel's art remains very much relevant today. You have this personification of anger, you have uh, a representation of violence, of war going on, but you have also, which is very important in this painting, but you can see it in other paintings uh, by uh, Bruegel as well, it is like um, mocking, uh, criticizing the uh, hierarchical relationships between men and women. And you have the inversions of their traditional roles in society. So now, almost half a millennia later, Royal Museum of Fine Arts in Belgium pays tribute to one of the forefathers of European painting by celebrating and sharing his works. Thanks for joining us here on Showcase. And if you're looking for more of our coverage of the global art scene, you can find it on our YouTube channel. But before we leave, let's go on a brief tour of Istanbul. But this time around, don't expect the usual. Instead, let's see it through the eyes of Turkish graphic designer Yasin Yaman as he turns the city by the Bosphorus into a surreal fantasy. I'm Elif Bereketli. See you next time. <laughs>